So this is the second of a series of five videos thinking about Paul's letter to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians. In the first video, I just went through a little bit of an introduction to the letter as a whole, thinking back to Acts 18 and its description of Paul's ministry in Corinth, and then just some of the features of Corinth that it's helpful for us to be aware of in order to best understand Paul's letter. Now, at the start of this video, diving into 1 Corinthians chapters one to four, I want to highlight first the importance of introductions. This was something that really stood out to me when I was at Bible College, learning about the book of 1 Corinthians. That it's easy for these first few verses to be seen as simply nice platitudes, a sort of general warmish greeting in order to set the scene for what comes. But the lecturer who was teaching me pointed out that actually Paul is very strategic in his introductions to the letters that even at greetings stage, he is very much setting the foundation for what's gonna follow. And so as we read through the introduction to Paul's letter, there are a number of key themes that Paul introduces that we then see outworked through the letter as a whole. And this is right from the start. So straight in at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse two, we read these words. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified or made holy in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Now, one of the tactics that I've noticed as I read through Paul's letter is when he's trying to encourage a change of behavior because people's behavior isn't aligning with the way of Christ. He does offer rebuke and he does offer correction, but there's an overarching approach that he has, which is this is who you are in Christ Jesus and now live it. I.e. here, you are those who have been made holy in Christ Jesus. You are Christ Jesus's holy people. And as we read through the rest of the letter, his argument then is, well, this is what it now looks like to live it in these different situations. And we see Paul employ this tactic elsewhere in 1 Corinthians. So we read, for example, in 2 verse 16, we have the mind of Christ. This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Like what a profound truth that through the presence of the Holy Spirit within us, we have the mind of Christ. Just phenomenal. In uh, chapter six, verse 15, Paul urges his readers to remind themselves that their bodies, their physical bodies are members of Christ. And in 619, that their bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. That Christian worship isn't just cerebral. It's not just some sort of ethereal spiritual thing but we worship God as embodied beings. What we do with our bodies matters, whether we use our bodies to honor and glorify the Lord and to serve him, or whether we use them in self-centered and immoral ways. And then in uh, chapter 12, verse 27, Paul's reminder to the church that they are the body of Christ. This is who you are, now live it. I try to encourage the students at Moorlands to just bear this in mind in their own youth work or in their own preaching that if we follow Paul, we'll similarly be those who aren't always just there, you know, with the kind of this, you doing this wrong, do this differently, although there is a place for that kind of more direct correction. But actually to have an overarching approach that is always reminding people, this is who you are in Christ Jesus, a new creation, filled with the Holy Spirit, having the mind of Christ, and then encouraging them to live accordingly. Now, another theme that we see introduced in the introduction that uh, outplays itself later on in 1 Corinthians is the, is the theme of spiritual gifts. We read in verse four onwards, I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him, you've been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Now, this is a, an important introduction because when we get to the section on spiritual gifts, which we will do in video four, we'll see that there's actually quite a lot of issues with how the Corinthian church are using their spiritual gifts. But this introduction just alerts us to the fact that it's not the spiritual gift per se that's the problem. There's no issue with the abundance of spiritual gifts that the Corinthian church has. In fact, that's something to be praised and something to thank God for, that this is a gift from God that he's enriched them with so many gifts. But as we'll come to how they use those gifts then becomes really important. Uh, and then finally, we see Paul using that language of eagerly waiting 
for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. And right off the bat, as it were, Paul trying to orientate themselves forwards, to not live as those who are just fully immersed in the here and now, as if the here and now is all that there is, but rather to follow Paul's example, living as somebody who is orientated towards Christ's return, whose future hope really directs and guides their behaviour in the here and now. And when we get to our final video, video number five, when we think about 1 Corinthians 15, we'll see that this issue of uh, resurrection and their doubting of the resurrection is a big problem. And therefore really encouraging them to, to regain that sense of future hope, but not just as something that's kind of parked away as something that's interesting, that will become relevant when they die or when Christ returns, but as something that is determinative of how they live and speak and behave in the present time. Now you might want to just pause the video at this point and you might want to reread the greeting and just see if you notice anything else, any other themes that Paul introduces that are going to become important later on in 1 Corinthians. And as you've paused the video, I would also encourage you to read the whole of 1 Corinthians chapters 1 to 4, which I'm just going to share a few thoughts on in a moment. And in particular, pay attention to Paul's structure. How does he order his arguments? What follows what? And why do you think he structures his argument in this way? Once you've uh, had a chance to read, I'll share a few thoughts on this. Okay, hopefully you've paused and you've had a read for yourself. And we see that after this greeting where Paul introduces a number of important themes, and there is a positive sense to this greeting, and it really interesting. I find 1 Corinthians quite encouraging in that we can kind of look at our churches sometimes and maybe feel a little bit discouraged uh, and yet, if we read through 1 Corinthians, hopefully our church doesn't have quite so severe issues as this Corinthian church does. And yet, Paul hasn't given up on them. His opening greeting isn't, you know, oh, you're not really a church or you're not really God's holy people. There is a sense of um, just re reaffirmation of their identity in Christ that is encouraging, that despite their failures, despite all of the ways in which they're getting things wrong, Paul does, does still affirm their identity as those who are in Christ and encourages them in that way. But after this greeting, he is straight in with some fairly severe criticism. He writes this in chapter one, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas or Peter. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptise any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say you are baptised in my name. And it uh, goes on really to criticise them for these divisions that have risen up amongst them. What's the reason for these divisions? Well, it's difficult to know the details, but as I mentioned in the introduction video to 1 Corinthians, it's quite possible that they are looking at leadership through Roman lenses rather than through the lens of the gospel. That sense of reflected glory, if I can align myself with a leader who is well respected, who is seen as being wise and eloquent, that people will see me similarly as somebody who is wise and eloquent. And so we see that the Corinthian church are boasting in the leader that they follow. And there is a sense of arrogance and pride that lurks behind these divisions. Now I asked you when you paused just to have a think about the structure of this section because it does at first glance seem a little odd. Paul seems to flip from in this first section talking about division to then moving on to talk about the seeming foolishness of the cross then he makes a contrast between God's wisdom and human wisdom. Then he refers to his own lack of eloquence when he first communicated the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Then he moves on to speak about the wisdom and the revelation that comes from the spirit. And then with an even more stinging rebuke, he comes back to this topic of division again. And just uh, Paul doesn't pull his pr punches. We'll see this as we go through the letter. He writes at the start of chapter three, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. 
For since there is jealousy and quarrelling among you, are you not still worldly? Are you not acting like mere human beings? For one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos. Are you not acting like mere human beings? Now, hopefully, having read that little section immediately after chapter 1, verse 10 onwards, you can see the similarity of language. Paul again repeats that sense of some of you say, I follow Paul. Some of you, I follow Apollo, Apollos. So why is it that he interrupts the flow of his rebuke of their division with all of this other instruction relating to foolishness and wisdom, the power of the gospel, the Holy Spirit, and so on? Well, I mentioned in the introductory video that the overarching theme that links all of the different sections of 1 Corinthians together is that Paul's primary concern is that rather than think and behave in ways that are shaped by their Roman background, that the Corinthian church live in ways that are honouring to Jesus, that their lives and behaviour are gospel-shaped, as it were, that they're conformed by that mind of Christ that Paul reminds them they have in chapter 2. And so here we see that division is actually a symptom. And Paul does address this symptom because it's a pretty destructive sim symptom, but he's also determined to try and get to the cause. He's like a good doctor who doesn't just treat the kind of superficial manifestation, but wants to get right to the heart and actually treat the root issue. And as we read through these chapters, we see that their root issue is that they're seeing areas like status and power and wisdom, even that fundamental sense of human identity, who it is we are in their old Roman ways. And Paul is urging them to reconform their understanding in light of Jesus Christ and his work for us through the, his death and resurrection. And this sense of focus on identity, who, who it is that we are, is really important. All of us, in a sense, live out of who we are, or at least we live out of who we perceive ourselves to be. And so if our sense of identity is messed up, if that's not rightly aligning with who God says that we are, that will manifest itself in all sorts of damaging ways. And so for the Corinthian Christians, their understanding of who you are, or at least who you should be, is determined by a desire for status, a desire for honour, a desire to be seen as wise in human terms. These are the sort of things that are impressive in the wider Roman world. Wealth is impressive in the wider Roman world. And so these are the things that they're aspiring to. These are the things that they're seeking after. And Paul in this section just totally turns all of that on its head. Who is it that we follow? Do we follow somebody who was wealthy and in human sense had great status and great honour? No, we follow a crucified Messiah. We follow a saviour who was willing to be humiliated, willing to be shamed, willing to take on great pain and suffering in order that we might have life in and through him, so that we might be reconciled to the Father through his sacrifice on our behalf. This is the example that Paul follows. This is why he's not bothered about looking good in the eyes of the wider world. If you read through chapter four, you'll see that's, you know, again, Paul just really trying to flip this understanding of kind of status and honour on its head. Him and the other apostles, he uses this um, really powerful analogy. They're like those who are dragged along at the end of a parade. I mean, they're like the captives who are humiliated before everybody, you know, and people are kind of chucking rotten vegetables at them and, and so on. And in that, he sees himself as following the example of Christ. Now, you can see how countercultural this is in a Roman context that seeks after honour and status that rather than trying to be the person who's best esteemed, really the Christian life should be trying to be the most humble servant, trying to be the one who is most willing to sacrifice, the one who is more concerned about others than they are about themselves. This is the character of Jesus Christ. This is the character that Paul himself seeks to emulate and put into practice. And this is what we ourselves are called to do, not through our own strength, but through the power of Christ's spirit within us. Now we can see all of these things are so pertinent, aren't they, for today? Unfortunately, we can't look at the church around us or even our own lives and say that we are free from any desire for honour in the eyes of the world or status in front of others. 
we all perhaps can relate to that tendency to want to be a people pleaser, to want to do the thing that makes us look good in other people's eyes. And this challenge to follow a suffering Messiah, a, a sacrificial servant, is a really challenging one for us. And yet this is the challenge that Paul gives us. To not be those who cause division through our own pride or through our own jealousy or through petty quarrelling, but to be those who are filled with God's spirit, peacemakers who seek to build others up rather than glory for ourselves and are willing to live lives of sacrificial service. I know I certainly find that challenging, perhaps you do too, but that's why it's encouraging that right at the centre of this is that reference to the spirit and a reminder that it is the spirit who enables us to do these things. <laughs>